Welcome back. Let's begin with the news in detail. First off, the United States has threatened to hit China with at least another $300 billion of tariffs. Meanwhile, China has said it will fight to the end if the U.S. decides to escalate trade tensions. This comes as IMF chief Christine Lagarde called for a resolution of the U.S.-China trade conflict that could slash global growth in 2020. The IMF said the tit-for-tat tariffs could cost $455 billion in lost output next year. Washington had already imposed tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods in May. In retaliation, China increased tariffs on $60 billion worth of U.S. goods. U.S. President Donald Trump said both China and Mexico are desperate to make deals in their trade disputes with Washington. It's a lot different. Our talks with China, a lot of interesting things are happening. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, we're getting 25 percent on $250 billion, and I could go up another at least $300 billion, and I'll do that at the right time. But I think China wants to make a deal badly. I think Mexico wants to make a deal badly. Moving on, U.S. President Donald Trump has said that not enough progress was made in trade talks with Mexico. Following Trump's imposition of punitive tariffs, Mexico has blocked a caravan of some 420 Central American migrants bound for the U.S. The U.S. stressed that Mexico needed to do more to stop a surge in Central American migrants crossing the border. If the tariffs go ahead, the U.S. would be in a serious trade dispute with both China and Mexico, its top trading partners. Talks between the two countries are set to resume today. Meanwhile, six undocumented migrants have been killed as their vehicle crashed into a drainage ditch. Police said five others were critically injured in the accident. They said migrants crossed the U.S. border from Mexico illegally. Accident happened after police tried to stop the vehicle for overspeeding. And the U.S. has suspended educational, legal and recreational programs for unaccompanied migrant children. All activities not directly necessary for the protection of life and safety will be scaled or shut down. Officials said the influx of children is putting tremendous strain on the resources of the housing agency. The Refugee Resettlement Office has asked Congress for an additional $2.88 billion to increase shelter capacity. But the Department of Health and Human Services termed the budget as unallowable costs. The border agents apprehended over 11,500 unaccompanied children on the southwest border in May. In Denmark, the Social Democrats have stormed to victory in the general elections. The leftist opposition bloc got 96 seats against 79 for the ruling Liberal Party and others on the right. Denmark's Social Democrats claimed victory in parliamentary elections with 25.9% of the vote. Prime Minister Lars Rasmussen conceded defeat, paving way for Meta Fredriksson to take power. 41-year-old Fredriksson will be the country's youngest ever prime minister. In her victory speech, Fredriksson renewed her promise to increase welfare spending. Well, today, the 6th of June, marks the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings. Let's take you live to Versailles, where Trump is going to address the procession. ...of liberty. Today, we remember those who fell, and we honor all who fought right here in Normandy. They won back this ground for civilization to more than 170 veterans of the Second World War who join us today. You are among the very greatest Americans who will ever live. You are the pride of our nation. You are the glory of our republic. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts.
Here with you are over 60 veterans who landed on D-Day. Our debt to you is everlasting. Today we express our undying gratitude. When you were young, these men enlisted their lives in a great crusade, one of the greatest of all times. Their mission is the story of an epic battle and the ferocious, eternal struggle between good and evil. On the 6th of June, 1944, they joined a liberation force of awesome power and breathtaking scale. After months of planning, the Allies had chosen this ancient coastline to mount their campaign to vanquish the wicked tyranny of the Nazi Empire from the face of the Earth. The battle began in the skies above us. In those first tense midnight hours, 1,000 aircraft roared overhead with 17,000 Allied airborne troops preparing to leap into the darkness beyond these trees. Then came dawn. The enemy who had occupied these heights saw the largest naval armada in the history of the world. Just a few miles offshore were 7,000 vessels bearing 130,000 warriors. They were the citizens of free and independent nations united by their duty to their compatriots and to millions yet unborn. There were the British whose nobility and fortitude saw them through the worst of Dunkirk, and the London Blitz. The full violence of Nazi fury was no match for the full grandeur of British pride. Thank you. There were the Canadians whose robust sense of honor and loyalty compel them to take up arms alongside Britain from the very, very beginning. There were the fighting Poles, the tough Norwegians, and the intrepid Aussies. There were the gallant French commandos, soon to be met by thousands of their brave countrymen ready to write a new chapter in the long history of well, that was uh, Donald Trump speaking to the ceremony at uh, Normandy where they are gathered to commemorate the D-Day landings of 1944. Let's move on now. In Syria, 10 civilians have been killed in government airstrikes and shelling in the northwest province of Idlib. The bombardment came as citizens marked the religious holiday of Eid al-Fitr. Two children are among the six people killed in the town of Ghafar Awid. Regime airstrikes also hit a motorcycle in the town of Marit al numan killing a woman and her two children. Another civilian died in regime shelling on the northern Hamar countryside. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia and the UAE have expressed concerns over deteriorating situation in Sudan. Both the countries called for resumption of dialogue between the military council and protesters for peaceful transfer of power. Talks between military and protest leaders halted after the government cleared the sit-in site by force. According to the opposition, death toll in military crackdown has risen to more than 100. Sudan's health ministry claimed that 46 people killed in operation. The Transitional Military Council has launched an investigation into recent violence and offered to resume dialogue. Opposition groups rejected the ruling Military Council's invitation for talks. World powers including the US and Britain denounced the use of force on protesters and called for free and fair elections immediately. In Iran, President Hassan Rouhani has welcomed developing relations with Qatar. Calling regional tensions detrimental, Rouhani said his country has no intentions to start any conflicts with world powers. He said regional issues have no military solution and economic sanctions were counterproductive. 
President Rouhani also appreciated Qatar's stance at the Gulf Arab summits. Qatar had denounced the final statement of the summits, which condemned Iran over escalating tensions. Next, Chinese President Xi Jinping has met Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. The two leaders outlined a number of mutual foreign policy goals. They also signed several agreements, including a $3 billion nuclear deal. Take a look. Chinese President Xi Jinping was received with full honors at Vukovo Airport in Moscow. Russian leaders later met the Chinese delegation and kicked off bilateral talks. President Vladimir Putin pointed out that trade between the two countries had increased significantly. Last year, we set a goal to reach 100 billion US dollars of bilateral commodities turnover. Due to the efforts of our teams, our two governments, we exceeded this number. We have 108 billion dollars. And this year in the first quarter, trade is also on the increase. It is already more than 3.4%. Russian President Vladimir Putin said Beijing and Moscow wished for peace in Venezuela and the Korean Peninsula. Chinese President Xi Jinping Ping said Beijing and Moscow would continue to grow closer. Our bilateral relations have not reached the maximum and can become even better. We are ready to work together with Russia in order to continuously increase the effect of our country's high-level cooperation so that our cooperation could give our two peoples a bigger sense of achievement. The Chinese president will also attend the 23rd St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. Both premiers vowed to preserve the Iran nuclear deal. The two leaders also signed a 3.1 3 billion US dollar nuclear deal. In Australia, police have broadened the scope of their investigation against journalists for holding and leaking classified information. Authorities said journalists could face jail term if proven guilty. Earlier, the police raided the head office of the government funded Australian Broadcasting Corps and the home of a news corporation editor. It's important that people realise the reason why we are so strongly in our view of well, certainly protecting top secret and secret information is that the Australian government, or particularly the Australian law enforcement and intelligence communities, rely on secret and top secret information from our international partners, particularly Five Eyes partners, to ensure the fact that we keep the Australian community safe. Welcome back. Now, Britain's Conservative Party leader Michael Gove has warned that rushing into a no-deal Brexit could trigger a national election. The leading candidate for Prime Minister's post said that the no-deal Brexit might propel Labour's Jeremy Corbyn to power. Environment Secretary Michael Gove said he would be prepared to delay Brexit beyond the arbitrary October 31st deadline. Gov urged that the UK must not be bound by a fixed date if it needs slightly more time to get a deal, but he insisted any further delay would be a matter of weeks, not months. Other candidates like Boris Johnson and Dominic Raab insist that the UK must follow the deadline with or without a deal. US President Donald Trump has reassured Ireland that Britain's exit from the EU will work out fine for it. Trump compared the Irish Brexit border issue to his efforts to build a wall along the US-Mexico border. Donald Trump visited Ireland for the first time as US President. Prime Minister Leo Varadkar underlined Ireland's concerns over the Brexit departure. He said Trump understood that Brexit cannot result in the return of a hard border on the island. President Trump claimed that the issue of the Irish border after Brexit would not be a problem. We'll see what happens over in the UK because that's going to be decision number one, who is going to be prime minister. And once that happens, that person will get in and try and make a deal. And maybe if they don't make a deal, they do it a different way. But I know one thing, Ireland's going to be in great shape. In Uganda, at least six people have been killed after heavy rains triggered a series of landslides in the eastern Bududa district. The Red Cross said dozens of others are missing and over 150 houses destroyed in the natural calamity. It said 27 others were injured in different weather-related incidents. Rescue officials have also warned against pneumonia, cholera and diarrheal outbreaks. Rebuilding has begun in the war-torn Syrian city of Aleppo as workers strive to restore a popular bazaar to its former glory. Take a look. 
At the end of 2016, the Syrian government announced it had recovered Aleppo from extremist groups. Reconstruction work in the city has been ongoing since then. Workers are striving to rebuild a badly damaged bazaar in the war-torn city. They aim to restore the once popular marketplace to the hustle and bustle it enjoyed in the past. The rehabilitation project includes many procedures and mainly focuses on eliminating the signs of the war. The overall repair work was estimated to take about eight months, with the renovated bazaar expected to be finished in July. But the repair work has since encountered many hurdles. Workers have come across unexploded dynamite, shrapnel, and there's the trouble of sourcing rare construction materials. But the big challenge now lies in how to attract vendors to return. We have overcome most of the difficulties, but the main problem is how to persuade people to come back and repair their shops, as we only rehabilitate the main structure of the bazaar rather than private shops. The city faces many more reconstructions construction challenges besides this old bazaar, all requiring significant financial aid and time. Nepal has retrieved four bodies and collected some 11 tons of decade-old garbage in a drive to clean up Mount Everest. Climbers returning from the world's highest mountain said its slopes are littered with stuff left behind by campaigners. None of the four bodies have been identified and it was not known when they died. Nine mountaineers died on the Nepali side of Everest in May, while two perished on the Tibetan side. Nepal this year issued 381 permits to Everest, costing $11,000 each. Over in the US, a unique museum in Washington is ready to exhibit the connection between ecological events of past and present life. The Fossil Hall at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History is all set to reopen after an extensive upgrade. The new exhibit at the hall is now going to showcase 3.7 billion years of life on Earth. What they're going to see when they come to this exhibit is an amazing story, the story of our planet from the very beginning of life on planet Earth all the way to the present and into the future. The aim of the exhibit is to show how ecological events of the past are pertinent today. The ecosystems, climate, geological forces and evolution are all interlinked. I think it's special because it brings together all the different forms of life that we have a fossil record for and shows how they're connected to each other and they formed ecosystems through time. And then when we get up to the present, we see that, that the world can sustain all these different forms of life and has sustained them. The hall contains more than 700 specimens, including plants, reptiles, mammals, insects and dinosaurs. While the museum underwent refurbishing, many of the dinosaur fossils were temporarily relocated to Canada. The museum will be open to the public on Saturday. First up in the world of business, India's central bank has cut its key lending rate to counter a slowdown in economic growth. The Reserve Bank of India's benchmark interest rate was reduced by 25 basis points to 5.7%, the lowest level in nine years. The third cut this year comes after GDP growth stumbled below 7% in the first quarter of the year. The central bank changed its lending stance from neutral to accommodative paving the way for further policy easing. The RBI reduced its GDP growth forecast for India to 7% from 7.2%, the slowest pace since 2014. Chinese telecoms giant Huawei has signed an agreement to develop a 5G network in Russia. Banned by the US last month, Huawei will develop the 5G network in partnership with Russian firm MTS over the next year. The deal was signed during the visit of Chinese President Xi Jinping to Russia. US Italian carmaker Fiat Chrysler said it has abandoned its $35 billion merger offer for French rival Renault. Fiat Chrysler said political conditions in France did not allow the merger to go through. Earlier, Renault said its board of directors did not reach a decision on the merger at an emergency meeting. 
It was called by Renault's largest stakeholder, the French government. In basketball, the Raptors have won comfortably by 123 points to 109 over the Golden State Warriors in Oakland, California. The match was virtually a contest between the Warriors point guard Stephen Curry and a rampant Raptors offense. Curry scored 47 points, grabbed 8 rebounds and provided 7 assists. But with three key players injured, the Warriors could not keep pace with the Raptors. All five starting Toronto players scored in double digits, led by Corhi Leonard with 30 points. The next game of the final series will be played on Friday. And in football, Portugal has beaten Switzerland by three goals to one to qualify for the Nations League final. Superstar Cristiano Ronaldo led Portugal to victory with a hat-trick. He opened the scoring in the 25th minute with a free kick. The Swiss equalised with a controversial penalty after half-time, but Ronaldo scored two late goals to send Portugal into the final. Portugal will face the winner of today's semi-final between England and the Netherlands. The final will be played in Porto on Sunday. And now let's take a look at the weather around the world. Well, that was all we have from our news bulletin at the moment, but do stay tuned to Indus News for more updates. Thanks for watching.